Hi everyone and welcome to the um, SOAS Development Studies Department uh, talk. It's great to see uh, so many people here interested in our postgraduate programs uh, and in development studies. So I'm just going to give a, a kind of presentation who we are as a department, what makes us distinctive, um, uh, talking about some of the things that you can expect to find uh, if and when you come to us. And then there'll be time at the end for questions. It's entirely up to you if you want to kind of ask a question out loud, if you just put your kind of electronic hand up uh, and then I'll call on you and then just unmute yourself and ask, or you can type it into the chat box. Um, and uh, I'll, I've got both uh, of my boxes open, so hopefully I should be able to see you. Uh, okay, well, let's get started. <clears throat> so um, I'm assuming that all of you will have looked at our programs online and the structure of the program online, which is one of the reasons you're here, because you're interested in the programs that we offer. So what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to cover the detail of the structure of the individual programs. Um, although if you want to ask a question about that afterwards, that's absolutely fine, of course. But I, I strongly recommend if you haven't gone to look at the website, please do go and have a look. You can look at not only the outline of the programmes, but you can click through and you can find descriptions of exactly what each module looks at, what it covers <clears throat> and the topics that it looks at. And of course, you can get in touch with anyone for any of the modules you're interested in, as well as the programme conveners and the admissions tutors or come to me if you've got any questions uh, and if I can't answer it I can find someone who can. And I'm guessing that most of you are thinking about our programmes either because you want to work in global development or in a related area in some capacity or perhaps you're already doing so and you'll, you want to do a master's programme to perhaps take a step back from your day-to-day -day role and the work that you're doing and the challenges of operating in development or humanitarian environments and reflect perhaps on what it is that you're doing and how it ties in with broader thinking about global development. Some of you may well have studied global development as part of a first degree, others may have touched on it uh, a little bit, some this may be entirely new for all of you and our students come from all of those backgrounds. Um, so we have a, a wide range of students and I'll talk more about our students and who they are a bit later. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold at the moment. And of course, I imagine that all of you um, are already interested, if not active, in some way in global development issues and campaigning and advocacy and so on. So I don't need to go into too much detail about why it's important as an issue, but just to give some context. You know, so the the overall context in which our programme sits is a story of great progress, of course, if we think about what's been achieved over the past half century or so. But nevertheless, there are still huge gaps in addressing poverty. So although, for example, over the past couple of decades, the mortality rate of children uh, has fallen by around 50%, uh, maternal deaths have also fallen quite considerably, down by about 40% uh, from the year 2000. But despite that, we know that still 800 women and 15,000 children, including 7,000 newborns, will die every single day. Global poverty similarly has been falling over the past decade. But despite that, a quarter of the world's population are living on less than $3.20 a day and around 700 million people. So, you know, around a tenth of the world's population are living in extreme poverty on less than $1.90 a day. And of course, we also know that one of the impacts of the COVID epidemic is that it is already pushing people into extreme poverty or into poverty. Um, so we know that the, the number of those living in extreme poverty is likely to rise by around 150 million by the end of this year. <clears throat> and of course, we don't know what's likely to happen in the year or years to come as a result of COVID. And the impact of the climate emergency as well is going to be pushing additional numbers, very large numbers potentially, into extreme poverty. Uh, around 82 million people uh, were forced from their homes last year, forced to flee either internally or to another country. And almost nine tenths of those <clears throat> are, of course, housed or living within uh, developing poor countries rather than in developed countries. We've just seen in Afghanistan a new crisis that is likely to see a significant um, 
outflow of people adding to the pressure that is on systems on organizations responding on host governments in poor countries who are so under resourced in coping um, with the financial as well as social needs of, of helping large numbers of people and we can see regions like the european union countries like the uk and the united states who are not only doing very little to help but actively making it harder for those fleeing from persecution, violence and fear to reach safety. <clears throat> so together across the broad suite of our programmes, they're looking at some of the most urgent and pressing of global issues that we're facing today and will be facing over the next medium, even long term. Our masters and our research students are engaged with understanding and thinking about these huge challenges and huge topics and what they tell us about the idea of development itself. <clears throat> so for those of you who are perhaps new to the subject of development studies or global development and are thinking what is it that we actually look at? Essentially development studies is the study of how individuals become poor and remain trapped in poverty. It looks at what it means to be poor when we say someone is living in poverty or in extreme poverty, what do we actually mean? What is the experience of that? What are the specific vulnerabilities? Uh, Babatunde, I can notice your microphones, and if you could just unmute it, that would be great, because we're getting some feedback from your microphone. Thank you. Um, it also looks at what international organizations and governments um, are doing about poverty, both in the global south, but of course also in the global north. What are uh, donors trying to do to address poverty? And are those policies actually working? Or perhaps are they having no effect or even making things worse? And this means the study of development is, uh, is forcing us to ask some quite challenging and difficult questions. Firstly, what is development? What do we mean by that term development? How do societies change? And how should societies actually change, perhaps? Why have some countries or regions not developed? And who defines whether they have or have not developed? What policies and programs, what structures, what systems can help make good change happen? Uh, and which actors, perhaps, are better at making good change occur and supporting communities than others? It also asks, is development a good thing? Now, this may seem a really strange question to ask, but actually development is a term that can be used in all kinds of ways. Uh, and development policies can have all kinds of impacts, intended but also unintended consequences. And they may not always be good for particular groups of people. So development itself is a contested and challenging and challenged term. Um, and within the specialist programmes, the violence, conflict and development, migration, environment and so on, we apply those specific lenses to the same broad questions and understandings. Oops, sorry. So development studies and the various programmes around that look at these arguments and the evidence for each and they help you make up your mind about what you think about development, global development or migration policy or environmental policy, uh, about efforts to, to rebuild conflicted societies, to engage in humanitarian action and so on, and to think about how good change can be brought about. So it's an interdisciplinary, sorry, I think I've just skipped a slide accidentally. There we go, sorry. So it's an interdisciplinary uh, degree, which, and what that means is that we bring together colleagues and approaches from a broad range of social, largely social science disciplines to examine and explore all of these questions. So we have colleagues who work in politics, in anthropology, um, in sociology, economics, politics, history, all applying that diff those different lenses to come up with different ways of looking at these problems to ensure that we get as full a picture as possible. It's also both global and local in focus. So development studies doesn't just look at the countries and regions of the global south. It also looks at what's going on in the global north, about the levels of interconnectedness, about the ways that policies and practice um, within the global north can impact 
on poverty and vulnerability and instability and migration, population movements in the global south. And of course, it looks at the ways that global south countries are talking and interconnected between themselves. So global, so south-south cooperation, collaboration, learning experiences, and so on. So for example, if you think about a topic such as migration, we could look at it if we were just taking a global south perspective from, from asking why, why it is that people move, why it is that people leave their homes. And we might think about what their experiences are that have either led them to do that and once they've moved. We could take a slightly broader perspective and think about the experiences of people as they cross different countries, as they cross different regions in search of a better life. But we also need to think about it from the perspective of the global north. Not only what the experiences of those migrants who are seeking to get into and once they are into global north countries, but the way in which global north countries are perhaps driving some of the factors that are causing this instability in these processes to take place in the same uh, uh, and, 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 and by doing so gain a much fuller question. It's only by looking at it from this total perspective that we can really understand what's going on. And that, of course, is true for all of the issues that we're exploring through our programs. So what makes so as as a department or our development studies department distinctive <clears throat> you will know if you've done your research there are a number of universities and institutions which also have long-standing development studies programs and although there is some overlap of course about the things that we're looking at the questions that we're asking <clears throat> each of these departments has its own distinctive approach so one of the things you need to think about is where will i feel most comfortable which approach to development and which character or what character of each department best fits my aspirations for where I want to take my learning journey and journey in gaining more knowledge and understanding around global development. So look, we're a top five department for the discipline in the world. Uh, so our expertise is recognized. We're a very diverse department, as you will know, if you know anything about SOAS. SOAS is one of the most diverse places or diverse universities in the world uh, in terms of its student body, but its staff is also incredibly diverse. And we have colleagues um, from around 10 different countries representing a wide range of disciplinary backgrounds, working on a range of themes and a range of geographical areas. We all have experience in working outside of academia, working on and with international organizations or NGOs, with governments, trade unions, and social movements. And we're all engaged in ongoing policy debates and action, as well as our more academic focused research. And all of this is brought into the teaching that we're doing at master's and postgraduate research level. So I think there are five things that mark out our department that make us different from the other departments. The first is that we take a very context specific perspective. Now, what I mean by that is, and I suppose this speaks to the broader mission of SOAS itself, <clears throat> that we don't just look at thematic issues within global development. So international finance institutions, the role of NGOs, violence and conflict, agricultural change. We look at them through a very specific geographical lens. All of the staff work on either region, uh, countries and regions in Africa or in Asia, actually quite a few also work on issues in Latin America. And that for us is really important because we feel that you can only understand the impact and the opportunities for development through a context specific lens. Just because something worked well in Bangladesh doesn't mean that you can simply transplant that project and expect it to work the same in Cameroon. Just because a group of people in one region responded well or responded badly to a particular intervention doesn't mean the same thing will happen with either the same group or certainly a different group of people elsewhere. So we understand that you need to think about the difference that place and group make in understanding global development and violence and migration and so on. And we think this is actually one of the things that makes our students so distinctive as well. And one of the things that is so uh, appreciated uh, and welcomed by employers because they know not only are you bringing 
a broad general understanding of global development, but you understand the importance of place and geography, you will have some kind of expertise in region as well as in the more general theory and themes of global development. The second thing that perhaps marks us out is our approach to the fundamental questions of what development is and what it should be. Now, of course, like you know, any group of colleagues with a large number of colleagues, there isn't total agreement. We have as many disagreements between ourselves as we do agreements. But generally speaking, in different ways and across different topics, we do take a broadly critical perspective on current development orthodoxies. Um, I suppose in particular, but not only challenging neoliberal based policies uh, and approaches from dominant global development actors, most of which are based in the global north. And most of it, and we all kind of share an agreement that one of the roles of our research and our work, and one of the uh, aspirations for our teaching and for the things that our students go on to do is to encourage and help promote and support stronger voices from the governments and citizens of the global south in the debates and policy setting that affect their day-to-day -day and lives and their long-term futures. And as I've already talked about, all of us are involved in research um, uh, and development practice. And again, this means that you know, our department character is shaped by the research projects that we're doing. Now you can go and have a look, all of us have a kind of a staff profile and on that we all talk about uh, um, the research that we're doing. So you can get a really good sense of the breadth and range of, of research that is being done by my colleagues across the department. I'm just going to throw in a, a few examples just to give you some ideas of the kind of things that we're doing. So Laura Hammond, for example, uh, you know, a globally renowned expert on issues related to migration and also to migration politics, development um, and instability in the Horn of Africa. And she's leading a major global research project, which is looking at migration and migration policy um, with a particular view or a particular focus rather on the drivers. What, did it, what is it that is making or forcing people to move? How are they moving? Uh, and what is their experience and what are the consequences of that? And this is linked into um, <clears throat> efforts to try and influence and shape and impact upon uh, migration policy in the EU. Jonathan Goodhand, another of my uh, colleagues, is working on a major research project, a really interesting project looking at the way that drugs and uh, illicit drugs and other illegal economic activity are impacting upon conflict states on public health and livelihoods and this is focused on afghanistan on colombia uh, and myanmar and the aim here is to try and develop new approaches and policy reforms that can help in post-conflict reconstruction we also have uh, a group that's part of the department um, called Positives Negatives, and this is a really interesting group. You may actually have come across some of their work. Um, they produce comics and animations and podcasts about social and humanitarian issues with a particular focus on conflict, on migration, on refugees, and on asylum issues. <clears throat> and actually what makes them really interesting for us is not only are they kind of doing their own projects, but they're also working with colleagues. So for example, they've worked with Jonathan Goodhand in trying to find really innovative and interesting ways of passing out, passing on the, the findings from his research project to reach wider audiences and to try and engage with people who wouldn't read uh, the normal kind of academic texts where research traditionally appears. So it's a really innovative way of, of kind of spreading out to the world and to new groups the research that is being done i've just been working on a major project looking at uh with an international team of researchers looking at a major um a child, a, a ngo that has a child sponsorship model um which is something that you will certainly have come across a feature of many uh ngos fundraising activities uh, and we were also looking at the role that religion plays in shaping what this ngo does how it does it uh, and what the opportunities but also the challenges and problems might be the other feat, uh, kind of thing that makes us distinctive i think is this is the decolonization agenda now <clears throat> this is something you will all have heard about and, and i suppose in recent years the term has become 
by some quarters anyway, one of abuse as much as it is an opportunity for others who are working in this to do something exciting and different. Uh, and many institutions are talking about decolonization uh, and the way that they're trying to adopt uh, a decolonized model to their teaching. But so as actually this means something tangible. Uh, a lot of the work that is being done within the UK has been led by colleagues uh, within and across SOAS as a whole. And it does shape the curriculum. It does shape the way we teach, what we teach, the kind of resources that we use when we're teaching. And of course, this is tremendously important for all the things that we believe in at SOAS, about ensuring that everybody's voice is heard, that we pay respect um, to those ideas and those theories and those thinkers uh, and those activists um, who may be ignored in more traditional environments. But it also has some really important transferable skills because it links into this idea around cultural intelligence and cultural knowledge. Now, employers can teach people how to do basic processes. It's very easy, it doesn't take much time. But what they find it much harder to teach is this kind of level of cultural intelligence, cultural awareness, the, the, an understanding that just because you and many other people think in a particular way, that doesn't necessarily mean that the majority of the world does. And that's sought after by employers. The idea of cultural intelligence is something that is becoming much, much more important. And that is one of the key important outcomes of a decolonized model. It's not just about doing it for issues around social justice, but that's what drives us, but it also has these other benefits for our students and from our teaching. And finally, what makes the department distinctive is we are based in SOAS. SOAS is an amazing place to study. It has quite rightly a global reputation for the institution and what it does, um, because there are there's nowhere else that does it. There is nowhere else that says we are going to focus on Africa and Asia and we will apply the social science, humanities and arts disciplines to an understanding of that. So it's full of people who have share the same interests, the same um, aspirations, the same desire for change and for engagement uh, with the global community that you do. Our library is one of the best libraries in the world for resources on Africa and Asia. It's the National UK Library for such resources. Um, there are every day there are events happening there are talks many of which will be relevant uh, to your studies others you will go to just because you find them interesting uh, it is truly an inspirational and amazing place to study and i know that because i did all of my postgraduate degrees at soas um, so i had that same soas experience I should also be said actually that the fact that we're based in London makes a difference. If you think about the organizations around global development, so many are either based in London or have people regularly coming through London that you know, even outside of SOAS, there are a huge number of events, uh, seminars, meetings, campaigns going on that you can get involved in. And that's a tremendously important, I think, uh, to all of our students who make use of those resources. Uh, and of course, you know, within uh, less than a mile. You have um, uh, universities of LSE, you have UCL, for that anyone interested in global health, you have the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And these are all resources and libraries that you can make use of. They also hold public events that you can go and attend. Uh, and so it, cre it creates a, a hugely dynamic intellectual as well as activist environment that our students can get so much from as well as of course, uh, staff as well. So what is it that our programmes give you? So our programmes give you, firstly, a very strong and interdisciplinary social science training. So you may have come from a particular discipline like economics or politics, and of course, you know, that will feature very strongly in your studies. But what's also important is understanding the way that taking a slightly different disciplinary approach and focus can give you different answers or a different perspective on a problem. And by combining them, it gives you a really strong foundation for acquiring new skills and for taking with you. It gives you key skills in how to ask questions, how to challenge orthodoxies and powers in what they're doing, to explore issues and to develop your own answers, your own solutions, your own ideas about what can be done to create good change. And it gives you an understanding of the processes that lead to global and national and regional and local social change. What kind of things might be more conducive? What things perhaps less so? What are the challenges 
What are the spaces of opportunity? It gives you an understanding, a deep understanding of the specific issues and topics within global development, whether it's migration or conflict, environmental change and its impact, humanitarian action, agrarian change, industrial development, and so on. And it gives you an understanding of what form they take in different regions, as well as a deep understanding of the way that our interconnected and globalized world works and functions, and at times fails to function, of course. And it gives you an intellectual home and a social and professional network that our students carry with them through the rest of their careers and their lives. So we don't tell you what to think. What we're trying to do, what we are doing is helping you develop as critical, independent thinkers. So you can contribute to debates and change as informed contributors and make your challenges and make your assertions based upon expert knowledge and an expert understanding of what the evidence is and how to use it and what it's telling us. And together, these provide uh, a vast range of, of key knowledge platforms for a career in global development. But actually, I think it goes much beyond that. It's not just about careers, although that may be your main focus, but it's about creating globally informed, globally active citizens. And I think that's the skills and the foundation that our programmes, whichever one you take, give you. Most of our students um, are planning to go on and work in the global development sector or are already working in the global development sector uh, or related area and are using this program uh, to help develop those skills. And so our programs, as I've just said, are designed to help you become deep thinking, deeply analytical and critical participants in development processes uh, to help you understand what kinds of intervention may be most appropriate and why, uh, help you identify how do you know what impact you've had if you've been running an intervention, both intended but also unintended? What are the potential consequences of different approaches uh, and what they might be for different groups uh, and communities? And above all, to think self-reflexively about what you and the organisation that you're working with uh, are doing for whom and why. And these are the reason that employers like our students not just because of the knowledge that they acquire, although that's really important, but because of those analytical and critical skills that they refine and sharpen during their studies. So as development studies alumni are known for that critical thinking, they can challenge orthodoxies and assumptions in ways that are helpful, in ways that are evidence-backed, in ways that can kind of, with pinpoint precision, identify what the weaknesses uh, and challenges of particular approaches are. They know the right questions to ask, they know the kinds of data they need, in order to justify the claims they're making uh, when something is to show whether something is working or not working. And this means our students go on to a whole range of different uh, career options after they've finished their programme. Some will go back to the organisations they're working for. Those who are kind of starting new in the sector go on to work uh, across a whole range of organizations. Uh, one of our, I've, I've thrown up in this slide in the previous one, just some examples of our former students and things they've said about that program. One of our former students is now the executive director uh, of Care International UK. Uh, we have former students who are working with organizations like the Danish Refugee Council, both uh, in Denmark, but also within individual countries like Djibouti and Ethiopia. We've got former students in NGOs like ActionAid, Oxfam, Save the Children, and in human rights organisations like Amnesty International, whereas others have gone on to work for formal donors like DFID um, or JICA in Japan or the South Korean Development Organisation, whereas others have gone on to work for large philanthropic organisations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Some work in areas that are not necessarily often framed within global development, but are clearly related. So for example, one of our former students on the Violence, Conflict and Development Programme went on to work in the London's Mayor Office designing programmes to deal with knife and other violent crime, drawing on the skills and expertise she had developed as part of that programme. And others have gone on to become journalists, uh, to do PhDs, um, to work in private sector, work for private banks, and so on, all making use of these kind of core skills. The point is that we don't have a typical destination for our uh, alums. They work in the sectors uh, and in the places where they feel comfortable, where they can make the difference they want to. 
And one of the purposes, one of the aims of our programs are to help you find that place, to help you understand where you can make the difference and help you get there. If anyone is thinking and here to think about doing a research degree, so coming in for an MPhil or a PhD, uh, we have a very large um, uh, PhD programme. We have about 60 students in the department uh, in total who are undertaking a huge range of projects across um, a wide range of topics and a wide range of geographical regions. All of the permanent staff uh, supervise PhD students uh, and their PhD students are a really important part of the research life of the department. Um, so just some maybe some advice here about how you go about applying for that. Now, of course, for undergraduate and, and postgraduate taught degrees, the primary relationship is with the institution and with the department. And obviously that does matter for PhD students as well. You are applying to the Department of Development Studies after all. However, the main relationship is with a supervisor. So you'll be supervised by a main or a first supervisor, and then you have a second supervisor as well, who together oversee um, your research, providing support and advice throughout the whole process. And because this is, I suppose, the main relationship, you have to, this, this matters when you're thinking about how to apply. So the first thing to remember is that it doesn't matter how good your research project is and how good you are uh, in terms of your kind of intellectual uh, experience to date. If there is nobody who is capable of supervising that project because you're doing it on a topic that no one has expertise on, for example, then we're not going to be able to make an offer. So the first thing that you do before you apply, it's really important to have a look at the department and see in that department who would be a good fit for your project, who works on a similar area. It might be they work in the same geographic area, on the same country or region, or it might be they work on a different country, but on the same theme, the same focus of your research. And once you've identified that person or those people, you should get in touch with them before you apply, introduce yourself, send them a draft copy of your research proposal. And it's really important to do that. We, we, we can't really make any decisions unless we see a draft proposal, as well as your CV, and ask them if they would be interested in um, supervising your project. If you can kind of get an informal agreement, that will really help in your application process, not least because they can offer advice about how you might want, might want to reframe your draft proposal. Um, so do go through that informal process if you can. If you, if, you, if you don't, it doesn't mean that you won't be accepted. It just means that uh, it, it might take a bit longer because it'll have to be seen by more people rather than going directly to the right person. Um, but it can, it can help you, not least because that way you can be confident that there is someone in that institution who has the knowledge and the breadth of knowledge in order to be able to supervise you on your project. In terms of how it works, um, obviously there, there are some um, cases where this isn't uh, the model, but generally speaking, in your first year, you work on the theoretical background, getting, getting to grips with what else has been written on the subject and on the various theories in order that you know what contribution you'll be making. And you produce an upgrade paper. So essentially, it will look like a, a chapter around 10,000 words where you explain what your project is, you talk about the methods you're going to be using in your field work, and that is used to upgrade you from the MPhil to the PhD. So everyone starts as an MPhil student, and at the end of the first year, they upgrade to the PhD, the full PhD programme. In your second year, most people will be going off then to do their field work, and then in their third and their fourth year, if they need it, that is spent writing up. Um, most students will be coming of course, back to London to do that. Uh, and they'll spend that time writing up their draft thesis and then polishing it up for final submission and then examination. If anyone does have any questions about the PhD program, uh, if you're thinking about applying for that, uh, obviously you can ask those uh, in the discussion that will follow. So what is it that we're looking for? So again, you'll have seen from our website um, that uh, you know, our, our kind of standard core uh, admission criteria, which is basically the equivalent of a second class degree uh, or higher in a relevant subject. And by relevant, we generally mean uh, a social science um, subject. But, and I think this is really important for you to remember, we look at all applications. 
So if you don't fall into that category, but you think you can make a strong case for why uh, you should be accepted, then you should get in touch with us. You should apply. You can always get in touch with the admissions tutor before you formally apply to explain and get their advice uh, as to um, what the prospects are for you being expected. We have people who come from all kinds of backgrounds, people who have done fine art degrees, have done physical sciences or engineering degrees, as well as kind of the, the standard social science degree. We accept, we've accepted people in the past who have had no degree, but they've got had really good, you know, long-term experience of working in global development. So if you don't fit that pattern, don't assume that you won't be expected, uh, accepted, but do get in touch with the relevant admissions tutor and perhaps talk to them and ask them what kind of things they would like to see in order for them to be able to make a decision. Because most importantly, we're looking for students who are motivated, who care about the world and finding their place in addressing global challenges. We're looking for students who are curious, who are willing to think about new ideas, who are willing to have their own views and assumptions challenged, to think about how others perceive the world. Um, people who are prepared to challenge common assumptions and common sense, in inverted commas, um, uh, and, and, and understand why they're doing so, uh, and think about what the, the alternative solutions or answers or debates might be. And we're looking for students who take a global perspective on the issues we face today and the issues we'll be facing tomorrow and thereafter because it's our students who really make the department what it is. And we're really proud of our current and our former students uh, who've gone on to do some uh, truly amazing things. Our students are really engaged whilst they're studying, campaigning, demanding change, helping us frame what it is that our programmes do. And they take those skills, that knowledge and that passion with them when they graduate. Uh, so of course, we'd love to have you join us and help you reach your potential as global change leaders. Uh, and finally, I'll, I've seen there's a question there. I'll, I'll come back to that uh, when I open up for questions. So look, please do have a look at our website. This has all of the information that you need to help you make a decision. It has outlines of all the programmes. It has the detailed structure of what that programme would look like, what modules you would take, as well as if you click through onto those modules, you can see exactly what each individual module focuses on. You can also find details of all of my colleagues, uh, including the admissions tutor for the programmes. And if you have a specific question about that programme, please do feel free to reach out to them, just email them uh, and you can ask any kind of question you want, or you can email me. I can always pass things on uh, whichever you prefer. So look, as I've said, it's our students who make uh, the programme. Uh, we're really proud of all of our students. So it would be great uh, to see you here with us next year or perhaps the year after um, to help you reach your potential uh, as global change leaders. So what I'm going to do, we've got about 15 minutes or so um, for questions. So if you want to ask a question, you can either put it in the chat site um, as Yusra has done, has done, and I'm going to respond to that one first. Or if you put your electronic hand up, um, I will see it. Uh, and I'll call on you to ask your question. Please don't be embarrassed to ask a question. If, if you want to ask it, it's almost certain that someone else wants to hear the answer to it as well. Um, but if you don't, if you if you don't want to ask a question in a public setting, that's fine. Or if you, after this is finished, you suddenly remember the question that you wanted to ask, um, you can always get in touch with me separately uh, and ask it that way. Um, so Yusra has asked um, if. Your undergraduate degree does not have a strong link to the programme. How can you compensate compensate for that besides work experience? OK, look, so this I th what we're looking for, that's a good question. So essentially, is you know, if you don't have that kind of social science degree, uh, which is the, 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 the basic qualification that we're looking for, uh, what do you need to do in order to persuade us that you would be good? Uh, you'd be kind of suitable for this program. So there I think it's about explaining why you're interested in global development. So it may be that you have been involved in um, some kind of student organization or you've been involved in some kind of campaign or some kind of process you've done volunteering work. So you should make sure you mention that. Some people, this is kind of an entirely new change of direction. They've kind of reflected on what they're doing and they've decided actually no, although I don't have much experience in this, I want to move on. So there I think it's about explaining your reasons, explaining your rationale for why you wanted to do this project. And it can really help if we're clear that you have actually looked at what we're doing 
looked at what we're teaching and you've used that so you're saying the reason i want to do this program is because and you can show how the things that we're teaching the, the structure fits in with what you want to do um, the best thing to do is to get in touch with the admissions tutor before you apply and speak to them and just say who you are give your background give your reasons and then they can give you specific advice um, and even just doing that shows that you're keen shows that you're interested uh, and, and that's of course one of the major things we're looking for I'm just going to take a couple that I've seen have come up in the chat, then I'll come to you, Kumar. Um, so uh, John asks if ICT for development is available for research or a cover topic at the university. We don't have a specific module on that, John. Um, we do have PhD students who are looking at that. So a PhD, you get to define the project you want to do. So it isn't a question of whether we do it. We'll do it if a PhD student, it'll be done because that PhD student is doing it. Um, at master's level, you know, we have lots of master's students who look at those kind of issues, particularly as part of their dissertation. Um, so for example, it happens that, you know, two of my master's students last year looked at um, uh, those kind of issues, um, FinTech uh, and other ICT issues as part of that. So you can build it into your program, um, even if it isn't a specific module. Um, I'm just gonna take one more from the chat, then I'll come to you, Kumar. So Julia has asked a question that I imagine all of you are thinking about, which is about tips on scholarships and financial aid. The sad thing is, and I, you know, I really wish this wasn't the case, it is really difficult to get scholarships. It is really difficult to get that kind of support. It's not impossible. Um, so the best way you can maximize your chances are firstly, have a look and see what scholarship, have a look at the scholarship page on the SOAS website, because that has a list not only of the scholarships that are offered by us as an institution, but other scholarships that are available um, to our students. Some of them will depend on your nationality or on other factors. So it's really useful to get a sense of the full range of what you can apply for. Um, in most cases, have a look for deadlines. If you're thinking of applying for a scholarship, it probably means you need to have applied by the end of this year, by the beginning of uh, early in 2022, and then think about the deadlines because many, most of them will expect you to have an offer of a place before they consider you. Um, so the earlier you apply, the better. It maximizes your chances of getting a scholarship. But the first point of port of call, have a look at the scholarships page on the SARS website, which will outline all of the scholarships that are available. It does get updated if new ones come in. So if you looked at it a few months ago, it would still be worth going and having another look. Okay, I'm gonna to go to the uh, main room now and just take a, a couple of questions. Um, and then I'll come back to the chat site. Uh, Kumar, go ahead. I'll put my camera on. Probably it's it's easier to, to see. Um, so so thank you very much, uh, Michael. And uh, I, I'm an alumni of, of SOAS, having done a master's in global diplomacy. My questions are the following. I'm very much interested in pursuing something linked to ethics and in the world of development, international development. Uh, so what would be the links with the, the faculty on philosophy? And second is the field work that you mentioned for a poster for a, for a PhD in the second year. Can that be combined? Uh, I, I'm based in Europe and I'm working at a full-time job. Could that be combined with what I'm doing as, as work? And could in some way with regular visits to uh, SOAS, uh, there be a sort of an online component that would supplement uh, following the PhD? Yeah, that's, those are good questions. So I think um, in terms of the PhD, uh, obviously your you know, projects sometimes span departments and so what we would tend to do there is to think of your first if you applied to the development studies department your first supervisor will be a member of the development studies department because obviously your thesis has to reflect that discipline so you need that kind of advice and support but we would probably think then about is there someone in the philosophy department who works on this kind of issue Actually, there are also people in the politics department who works on work on issues around ethics. So depending exactly what you want to do, but your research committee would be built up of people who have expertise in that knowledge. Um, and of course, you know, as a PhD student, um, you know, often our PhD students are taking master's modules to get kind of background knowledge and they can take those across the university. We work out what is relevant for them and their needs rather than saying it just has to be done within the department. Just to do a quick segue for master's students that you know one of the good things about our program is that it also allows you to take what we call open options 
And these are, are these are modules that are offered from across the university as a whole that may not look like they're directly relevant to development studies, but these allow you to choose things that you're interested in, as well as that development studies. In terms of the online, we don't have the capacity at the moment to do online teaching um, for the PhD process. I think the best thing to do would be to identify a potential supervisor and then to talk to them about the way that it might work and what might be required. We do have a residency requirement for the first year, um, but you know, I, th I think you need to have those kind of conversations with the potential supervisor. Um, and to see what uh, might be done. But sadly, at the moment, we don't have an online facility for PhD. Um, it's, it's in discussion, so it, it may occur, but I, I don't know. I'm not involved in, in that working group, so I couldn't give you any timelines on that. Um, Jackie, you. you've got your, you're welcome. Jackie, you've got your hand up. Jackie Habib. Hi, yes, thanks so much for um, this information, Michael. My question is regarding part-time online studies. I'm interested in both the MSc in humanitarian action and in international development. And I'm trying to understand the structure of both programs a little more. So I understand um, that there is modules in April and October. And uh, so I just want to ask a little bit about how that's structured. And I also don't see on the website a deadline for the um, April start. So I'm wondering if you know what that is. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't actually know what the deadline for the April start is. I imagine that it's I mean, I, I suspect that you could still look for the online program. I think you can probably still apply in March. Um, if you can you if you email me after this, if you send me a direct email, I'll, I'll follow up and then I'll get back to you on that issue of the deadline. If you just remind me of the question in terms yeah, of yeah, yeah, in terms of the actual structure. Yeah. So the, we, we have two um, start dates because you know, people taking the online program are often working full time. So it's a slightly different structure. We know people will come to it in in different places. Um, so it, it, the timing is different. It's, you know, it, it, I suppose it's the structure is the same as any program in that you know we have these times when these modules are running. So you would either you know once you're on the program, you'll probably take some modules in April, then you'll take other modules in October, and you'll gradually build up uh, the credits um, overall. And they they run kind of as, as you know they, they run online, but they have kind of a, a timetable, so they run over a set number of weeks, and they have those. Um, set sessions. Um, obviously, the, the modules themselves might look a little bit different depending on what they're done, depending on which department they run out of. Some of the, the modules are on different department. The best thing for any kind, if you're interested in one of those programs and you have a very specific question about the structure, the best thing to do would be to email the convener and the admissions tutor, they're the same person. Um, so, um, and they can give you very specific advice on that specific program or on an individual module within that. But if you email me after this, then we can carry on because I, I will have to find out and get back to you on that. Sure. Thanks so much, Michael. And if you're able to just share your email address again, that would be helpful. Yeah. So let me just go back. There we go. I'll leave that slide up. So that gives all of our. Thank you. Um, okay. I'll take. Uh, so I've got Susanna and then I'll go back to the chat site. Hi. Uh, hi. hi, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, I have a, an anthropology background and I'm very interested in political ecology. So I, I read that the Masters on Environmental Politics and Development has a strong uh, approach on that. And I was wondering, um, I've also noticed that there's like a new Masters in Anthropology named um, Anthropology of Global Futures and Sustainability. So I wanted to ask you if, if if you can tell me a little bit a little about the difference between those programs yeah i can't really because i don't it, it's in the anthropology department so I, I mean i don't if it's new as well um i don't know anything about it um and and so i i, I wouldn't feel confident enough to give you accurate information i think the best thing to do there is to um have a look at the structures you can put them up side by side and you mm -hmm. can look at the structures the main the main thing that I can talk about is that, you know, in the anthropology department, the approach is anthropological. Um, so that will be the, the disciplinary focus. In the development studies department, you, we have many anthropologists in the department, but the overall approach of the programme is not 
vested in any one particular discipline. So, for example, you may choose a module um, within the department that that doesn't take an anthropological approach that might take a political economy, uh, might take a mixed approach, um, uh, you know, might might take a whole range of different approaches. So I suppose if, if you're looking for something that is solely within the anthropological discipline, then that might be a factor in choosing which program will be most suitable. If it's on the topics and the best way to do that is to kind of just put up the two structures side by side, see what specific modules you take as part of that program, and then get a sense for whether one more meets your kind of needs uh, than the other. Um, but, you know, we're a small university. So the reality is that, you know, our students take uh, modules in the anthropology department, students in the anthropology department take our modules. So there's an awful lot of overlap um, as well. So it, it, they're not complete separate silos. Um, so I, I think you just need to kind of get a sense for which program structure works for you best. Yeah. Thank Thanks. You. Look, I'm just going to go back. I'll, I'll, if we've got time, I'll come back. Uh, actually, that may maybe there aren't any more hands up. Okay, uh, I'll just go to back to the chat site. So someone is asking, is wanting to apply to the gender studies and the development with gender reference, um, and uh, as two of your options. Um, should you include your interest in development in your personal statement? Look, I think if, yeah, I, I think it's always worth giving as much information about your intentions and your interests and your background and your personal statement, no matter what program uh, you're applying for, because um, it tells whichever program you're applying for, it just tells us kind of who you are as a student in a way that kind of a university transcript or even a CV can't really tell us. So, yeah, I would certainly put some of that in, particularly if you're kind of applying uh, for one or the other of the programs. Um, so Olivia is maybe it's not quite similar, but in a similar area, perhaps Olivia is asking if you're unsuccessful in getting into your first choice course, are you able to apply uh, to another? Yes, yeah, you can uh, you, you can apply to other courses, that's fine. Um, if, if you're unsure about whether you will be accepted, um, I, I strongly just just get in touch with the, pro, the admissions tutor and say, you know, what do you think? Um, you know, again, it, it tells us something firstly that you are keen enough to, to get in touch um, and we'll, we will always get back to you and and, uh, and, and consider you. So, um, yes, you can, but, you know, hopefully you'll get your first choice. Uh, OK, uh, so Bonka's asking about if I can expand on the humanitarian humanitarianism, aid and conflict program. Um, I mean, again, I think the best thing here, if you have pro questions about a specific program, I mean, obviously, I, I, you know, I know them, I, in fact, I help set it up. Um, but of course, the really detailed granular knowledge will be those uh, by the, 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 the person who is running that module. And as I've said, you know, the admissions tutor and the program convener are the same person. So you, for anything very specific, get in touch with that convener, because they can give you a really detailed view. And they can kind of even tell you, well, you know, in this module, these are the, the things we look at week by week as part of that module. Um, in terms of kind of more general comments, I guess, about humanitarianism, um, it's, I mean, it, as the title suggests, this is a focus not on, on global development, but actually on humanitarian action. So responding when people are in need, you know, in, in, during emergencies, be that conflict be that natural disaster and so on so the module as a whole is looking at the challenges for humanitarian organizations the debates uh, and um, difficulties with the way the humanitarian principles operate but also looks at you know what what does it mean to be in the midst of a, a humanitarian emergency for those kind of communities and individuals on the ground. So it's very much embedded within humanitarian discourses and debates rather than global development. Of course, there's overlap. Of course, because of the modules you can take, um, you, you will get a sense uh, of, of, of um, both more broadly, but it, it's very much focused within that particular area. Uh, and students can kind of bring their own experience and bring their own interests in terms of geographical regions to the way that they study and the things they look at, the answers they might focus on in their essays and so on, as is true, of course, for all of the programmes. But get in touch with a convener, Althea Maria Rivas, and she'll be able to kind of really talk you through the, the nitty gritty of that programme. 
Uh, I'm going to just take one more from the chat and then I'll go um, back to the main room. Um, so Gabriella is asking if someone's interests and personal statements are aligned with the program, does being a recent graduate make a huge difference during the admissions process? Look, you know, we, we don't, you know, we have students, you know, maybe half of our students are what we would call recent graduates, you know, either they've literally just finished their undergraduate program or within a year or two, and the other half are coming with a bit more work experience and, and both groups are welcome and do really well within our department we don't particularly distinguish between that what we're looking for are you know do you have you know if, if you have that kind of basic um uh you know that, that uh, second class degree in a relevant subject um then you know obviously that means we know that you're going to be capable of doing the program we will still look at your personal statement and and that's and what we're looking for there is i suppose to get a sense of, of who you are but perhaps you don't need to do as much persuading in that personal statement as you might do if you don't have that uh, second class degree in a relevant and a social science degree. So it's, there, it's important to do and we look at all elements and we consider all elements. It's just if you don't have kind of that relevant degree issue, that's when you need to do a little bit more work in your personal statement uh, than someone who does have that. Um, if I, if for anyone whose question I've kind of tried to answer, if I haven't answered it properly before, um, I'm apologies. And I can only take one more question because I think this room is going to be used by the next um, person. But if you, if you, or next presentation. But if you have any questions uh, and I haven't answered them, and I know that I haven't answered them, get in touch with me, and I can answer them by email. Um, uh, Kristen, I can take one more quick question. I think. Okay, so thank you for sharing. I want to know more about. A master of Research in International Development is it more recommended if I have PhD study plan? Because I haven't decided whether should I pay PhD, but I have some interest about research. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it, it doesn't. It, it exists because we needed to have. I mean, it, it's a good program, uh, and I'm, I, I'm not going to put anyone off it, it. But it doesn't make a difference as to whether you need to do. Um, whether you want to go on and do a PhD. The only difference it makes is for those people who already have funding for a one year master's followed straight away by a PhD program, because the funders then want them to take that specific program. But if you whatever program you take, you can take an option, for example, an optional module on research methods. Uh, and all of the programs that we offer, we consider and other institutions consider extremely good training for going on to do a PhD. So my advice to everyone thinking about a degree no matter what institution you're thinking about is find the degree that you are most interested in worry less about the title and more about the content and does that match are you going to be excited to do that uh, and if you are then that's the program for you if not maybe you want to to look around at another one um, but all master's programs in global development uh, are excellent training um, for those who want to go on to do a PhD or of course for those who want to go on and do something different to work in a career and so on thanks everyone I, I'm aware there's a huge number of questions please email me with them I will get back to you uh, as soon as I can with answers I'm sorry we didn't have more time um, for questions but thanks everyone for coming uh, and if you haven't got a question now, but you have one that comes up uh, again, get in touch with me and I'll do my best to answer it. Thanks, everyone.